Back in 1999, I had what I considered to be a pretty decent system. A Pentium 2 400MHz with a Voodoo 2, and I never really had any complaints about its performance in the latest games at the time. In many ways, I was extremely fortunate then, but that didn't stop me from drooling over the latest and greatest hardware while leafing through gaming magazines back then, even though there was no way I could ever afford most of the high-end stuff in those magazines. Well, fast forward 20 years, and now that hardware is totally affordable. And one of the joys of the retro computing hobby is being able to build and buy systems you lusted after as a kid, but usually because of its cost, seemed so elusive at the time. But that is certainly not the case anymore, so what I thought I would do in this video is build the type of system that myself, and pretty much everyone else I imagine, would never have been able to afford back then. An absolute beast of a gaming PC from early 1999, with no consideration paid to the budget. Something like these Alienwares, for example, that would have cost an absolute fortune back in the day, and would have been the envy of every kid on the block. So with that in mind, let's jump right into the build. The first component, and the one that helped inspire me to do this build in the first place, is this rather impressive 21-inch ViewSonic monitor I picked up a while ago. Way back in the 90s, there wasn't really a distinction between work or productivity monitors and gaming monitors like there are today. Back then, the best monitor you could get was pretty much aimed at the professional work environment, and they didn't come much better than this massive 21 inch from ViewSonic. Released in early 1997, this P815 monitor was originally priced at well over 2000 US dollars when new. That's for just the monitor. My whole system at the time, and I mean the whole system, monitor, motherboard, CPU, graphics card, the lot, was probably worth less than $1,000. So $2,000 for a monitor was just mental. Admittedly, by the time we enter the time frame of this build, i.e. early 1999, this monitor had gone down in price quite substantially and was only worth about $1,000. But still, $1,000 for just a monitor was a luxury that most people certainly couldn't afford. And what did your $2,000 or $1,000 buy you? Well, it was very impressive, that's for sure. Maximum resolution was 1800 by 1440 at 76Hz, which is pretty much full HD resolution as we would recognize it today, but in a 4x3 aspect ratio. Even more impressive though were the refresh rates at lower resolutions. This thing can do 800 by 600 at 160 Hz, and 1024 by 768 at 139 Hz. I was used to running everything at 60 or maybe 75 Hz back in the day, so these kind of refresh rates were just incredible. Even today I think they're still pretty impressive. The other impressive thing about this monitor is its physical size. It's massive and weighing in at over 33 kilograms, or almost 73 pounds for those of you in the US of A, it certainly is an absolute monster of a monitor. And in keeping with the monster theme, I wanted to pair this massive screen with a case that would do it justice. And that's why I've gone for this, a massive full tower. When you are packing a monitor this large, a full tower is the only way forward. Like the monitor, this case is huge and would dwarf most normal desktop cases of the time. Now granted, it's a bit of a mission to move around, but I still think it's the perfect case to complement the massive ViewSonic. So as you may have noticed, this case is looking a bit rough around the edges, being more than 20 years old and probably having led a very hard life, and obviously we can't pair such a nice pristine monitor with a case that looks this ratty. So we're going to be cleaning this case up, obviously, and hopefully we'll be able to get it looking as good as new. There are also some weird mods going on with this tower, which the previous owner decided to make and which do seem a little bit odd to me. Firstly, there are these three big fans which have been added to the system, and that obviously entailed making these massive holes in the top and side of the case. These holes are very roughly cut however, so I'm going to have to see if I can clean these up a bit during this build as well. Up here on the front panel is where it starts to get even more interesting, and also more dodgy. There are multiple switches which have been added to this drive bay cover here and they seem to be wired into each fan through these little chocolate block terminal connectors. 
It seems the idea was to be able to toggle each fan individually depending on which part of the system needed cooling the most. And then there is also this red tape blocking off the air vents. Which leads me to believe the previous owner was probably experimenting with airflow through the case. Maybe trying to control the way air flowed into and out of the case using different fan combinations to find which combination worked best to cool the system. I also think that perhaps there was some overclocking involved here and that maybe the previous owner needed to find all kinds of weird and wonderful ways to get rid of all that extra heat. It is pretty interesting granted, but I don't think my final system build will need this much cooling. But I can't exactly remove these massive holes in the case either, so what I'm going to do is just replace them with more modern fans, simply because these old fans are very noisy and we really don't need this much airflow anyway. Maybe that's also one of the reasons why the previous owner had them on switches, so they could turn them on and off to control the noise. Right, so let's have a look at what other components came with this case. First off, we have these two very nice optical drives. This one is a really cool SCSI Yamaha CD writer, which I think would have been pretty seriously high-end stuff at the time. And even though I have always been quite interested in SCSI, it was always way more expensive than IDE to get up and running, so I never really played around with SCSI at all. I always just thought of it really as a mysterious and mythical architecture used only in high-end servers and way beyond the reach of us mere mortals. But today that's going to change and I'm going to lose my SCSI virginity as it were and see if I can get this drive as well as a nice SCSI hard drive that I have acquired specifically for this build installed and working under Windows 98. The other optical drive here is an early DVD reader, but it is also a very cool one because it is a front-loading DVD drive, which I think are pretty rare. I also find these types of drives really nifty. They have no tray and you just load your disc straight into the drive. Far out, man. Anyway, obviously I'm going to try and clean up and service these two drives when I build the system and hopefully they will both still work. It would be a shame to lose either of these awesome drives. So other than the two optical drives, this machine has another nice surprise in the form of this motherboard. This is an ABIT BE6 motherboard incorporating the sought after Intel 440BX chipset, which is pretty much the one you want when building a retro system from this time period. So this is actually a pretty nice board and I will definitely be using this and those two optical drives from this case in my build later in the video. But before I do that, I need to strip this machine and clean up this case because it has been sitting unused and unloved for many years and it is pretty dirty. So let's get on that right away. Now that the case had been stripped, I wanted to take care of these awful holes that had been cut in the case to house the fans, and I decided to use this grinding disc attached to the end of an electric drill to do that. And although it did ruin the grinding disc, I suppose that's what they're for anyway, and the results were pretty nice. Uh, the holes came out looking much better than they did before, so I think it's a win. Finally, I used a metal handheld file to just smooth the outside of the holes and make it look a little bit neater. Once those holes were tidied up, I had to make a decision as to whether or not I wanted to respray this case like I had done with my previous build video for the e-waste PC, 
and although that came out pretty nice it does still kind of smell of paint to this day and the finish is not exactly like a factory finish it's still a vast improvement over what it was but for this case because it was in decent condition I decided not to go that route in fact the only slight issue with this case was this little bit of surface rust here at the back where you install your expansion cards so I thought I'd try something new for this that I read about on the internet and I found this ancient bottle of cloudy ammonia that looks like something that came straight out of the 1950s or the world of fallout. But apparently this can be used to remove rust so let's give it a go. Surprisingly enough that did actually work quite well so the next step was just to give everything a really good clean before assembly so I did that by putting the rest of the cloudy ammonia in this big zinc bath and then filling it up with water and giving it a good scrub. I also cleaned all of the external case panels in exactly the same way. But wait, our old friend Rustdorf is back again. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that this bottom panel was just a little bit too far gone. And even after cleaning it up, there were still rust spots and it just looked a total mess. So I decided that I would need to repaint just this one panel at least. It's no big deal though, because I don't think that you would actually notice the difference between this new sprayed finish and the finish of the original case on a cursory inspection anyway. Once the rust had been removed, I left the panel to dry in the sun and then gave it a coat of the silver galvanizing spray paint. Next up was to make a plan with this panel with all the little switches in it. Um, I don't think I'm going to keep this and use it for anything else. So what I decided to do was replace it with this instead. This is a hard drive cooler that fits in a five and a quarter inch drive bay. Uh, it's just four screws that you basically screw in and then it cools your hard drive. Now this is quite nice because I'm going to be running a SCSI hard drive in this build and SCSI hard drives do actually make more heat than a normal IDE drive so it is a good idea to have one of these. And this thing actually fits quite nicely in the panel up here as you can see. And as I'm sure you can see this is also very yellowed so we're going to need to retrobrite this along with everything else. But the first step before we can do that is to take this apart and strip it down ready for retrobriting. And there we are. Now these pieces can join the rest of the case in getting retrobrited. For this case I am trying out a new and improved retrobriting method and that is namely this hydrogen peroxide 40 volume cream. Um, this stuff is very nice. It's a pre-mixed solution. It doesn't require me to mix anything using xanthan gum or anything like that, which is the traditional method. And it's the right strength as well, so it's much easier to use and it should stick to the panel much better and provide a more consistent result. So I started by putting some of it in this cup, as you can see here, and then I just painted it with the paintbrush all over the panel pieces and covered them with cling film and then left them in the sun for a few hours. Hopefully this will give a more consistent result than the last retrobiting that I attempted which involved water and hydrogen peroxide in a solution left in the sun. Uh, that I wasn't really happy with its results, it came out very patchy so this I'm hoping will give me a more consistent and better result. Well it turns out that it didn't. Unfortunately even though I was very careful to make sure that the paste was evenly applied and that I moved the panel around in the sun and kept turning it I still got a very patchy result but luckily I was actually able to repair it just by putting it in the sun for longer with more cream and eventually I got something that I'm fairly happy with as you can see here. For the final step before I start assembling the system I wanted to just give these old panels a very quick coat of paint. They're actually not bad but they do have these nicks and scratches all over them. Um, they don't actually warrant a complete respray but they need just a bit of lightening up. So I decided to just give them a quick single coat of paint using this uh, Rust-Oleum Chiffon Cream Paint which is a very similar color to the um, original paint on this case which means I can do a very light coat and not have to repaint the whole thing in many layers to hide the color. 
I also did the same to all of the other external panels just to make sure that everything matched. So now that everything is clean, the case is ready to be put back together, so cue the music. So here's the assembled case after it's been cleaned up. There's still a bit of discoloration on some of the panels and they don't quite match up perfectly, especially the front drive bay covers. It seems I'm still struggling to get the same shade of beige out of all the different parts of the front panel even though they've been exposed to the same conditions and I'm using the same paste on all of them uh, for the same amount of time. So I think there's still a bit of work to be done here with the retro writing. But overall I'm very happy with the way this case came out and I think it's deserving of its place next to this awesome 21 inch ViewSonic monitor. Right, now we can get on to the most exciting part of the video and that is having a look at all the components we're going to be using in this build. I have them all laid out here on my work table so let's jump right in and have a look at each one in a bit more detail. As mentioned earlier in the video, uh, the motherboard we're going to be using for this build is this one, the ABIT BE6. Um, this is a slot 1 motherboard obviously and it's quite nice in that it has the desirable Intel 440BX chipset as I mentioned earlier. This was Intel's flagship chipset at the time and supported a front side bus speed of 100 megahertz, which allowed both the Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 to actually reach their potential. And this really is the chipset to have when building an old slot 1 machine like this. In terms of negatives, the only thing really is that it's an ABIT and I'm not really a big fan of the ABIT brand. I much prefer something like Asus. And also in reading reviews of this at the time, it seems that it was a slightly unstable board. So we might have stability issues later, but we'll cross that bridge if and when we come to it. But still, it is quite a nice board. It's got uh, these two ISA slots here, which is pretty nice. And also four PCI slots, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're going to be needing a lot of those PCI slots. And then we have this AGP slot and also 512 megabytes of RAM. So this board is definitely going to be my first choice for this build. However, if we do run into some kind of stability issues with this board, I do have a backup and it is this one. This is an Asus P299. Um, I much prefer Asus as a brand over ABIT, but unfortunately this board only has the 440LX chipset. Uh, so its FSB is only 66 MHz. This is a older chipset than the 440BX. So I'm really hoping that that ABIT board does work and that I won't have to resort to using this. But uh, this is just the backup board in case we really can't get anything working with the ABIT. Moving swiftly along, this is our processor for this build. It's a 450 MHz Pentium 3 or as I call it, a Pentium 2.5. And, and the reason I call it that is because although this was the first processor marketed as a Pentium 3, for all intents and purposes, it was basically just a Pentium 2 450 with a new architecture and a few minor improvements and instructions. In fact, this chip was sometimes slower than the Pentium 2 it replaced in some tests. Although reviews of the time stated that these new instructions did actually make a big difference in some games, which is obviously what we are most concerned about for this build, so it's a bit of a mixed bag really. Still, I don't think it really deserves the Pentium 3 name. I usually reserve that for the later Socket 370 Pentium 3. And that's why I tend to think of these as more of a Pentium 2.5 than a fully fledged Pentium 3. But let me know in the comments below if you agree with that assessment or if you think I'm being a little bit silly and that these early slot 1 Pentium 3s do in fact deserve the Pentium 3 name. But anyway, in early 1999 this would have been pretty much the fastest and most exciting processor you could get for a desktop PC other than a Xeon of course but those weren't really aimed at consumers anyway. And so this is the CPU that I'm going to go for for this build. On to what is probably the most exciting part of this build, or at least I think it is, and it's the 3DFX Voodoo 3 3000. This card was also released around the same time as our CPU in early 1999, and it was definitely one of the most exciting and eagerly anticipated graphics cards of all time. With performance that was around that of two Voodoo 2s in SLI, which was still a very impressive setup in early 1999, the Voodoo 3 was certainly fast. Plus it was a single slot solution, unlike the three slots you would need for a dual Voodoo 2 setup. 
It also had better image quality than that setup because it didn't need to use a pass-through cable between the 2D and 3D cards. So it really was a big improvement over the Voodoo 2 in many respects. It wasn't perfect though, it could only do 16-bit color compared to the 32-bit color of its main rival, the TNT2. And also, it wasn't quite as fast as the higher-end TNT2s, like this TNT2 Ultra here, for example. So, if I were wearing my sensible trousers, if in fact I was wearing trousers at all, I would probably go for this TNT2 Ultra instead, but I'm not going to. There is just something magical about 3D effects and voodoo graphics that the TNT2 just didn't have, and we can see that today in how popular 3D effects still is in the retro computing scene. Plus, 3D effects has Glide, which was still very widely supported at this time, even though Direct 3D was starting to make inroads into its dominance. But yeah, for the games I want to play on this machine, I consider good Glide and Direct 3D support to be pretty much required, and that means that the Voodoo 3 is the card to have. It's also the card I would have bought back in the day, so that helps. The next piece of my money is no object, no holes barred Ultimate 1999 gaming PC build is this uh, Seagate Cheetah SCSI hard drive. This was a really high-end hard drive back in the day. Um, it would have been something that was pretty unobtainable, at least in the consumer market. Um, and it's really, really fast, much faster than IDE, so this should make a really nice difference to load times. It's SCSI, obviously, as you can see. And what's also pretty interesting about this drive is these fins that have been attached to it to help with cooling. Uh, SCSI drives do run quite a bit hotter than IDE drives, so these fins, they might not be entirely necessary, but they certainly help and they can't hurt, so it is quite nice to have these. This also allows the drive to be mounted in a five and a quarter inch drive bay, along with that little hard drive cooler fan that we saw earlier. And speaking of that little hard drive cooler, uh, here it is. Uh, it's finished retro writing and I've just quickly reassembled it here. It's looking really good, almost as good as new. The only issue is that it's actually been whitened a bit too much by the hydrogen peroxide and it's actually whiter than anything else on the front of the computer case. And so that is, as I was saying earlier, a bit of a problem with this retro writing process is that some plastics tend to go whiter than others even though they were all in the sun for the same amount of time. But anyway, we'll just have to put it in and see how it looks. Next, because we are using SCSI in this build, we need a SCSI card. And this card is obviously going to run both the hard drive and this Yamaha CD-ROM writer here. This is an Adaptic AHA 940W or 940UW SCSI card. So this card is an ultra-wide SCSI card. It can do 40 megabytes per second, and it's got uh, three connectors, as you can see. It's got the old 50 pin up here, and then the more modern 68 pin, I think, over there. And even though this card has these three connectors, you can't use all three at the same time. You have to choose two. So you can either have those two, or maybe those two there, or maybe even those and that one. It doesn't really matter, you can choose. But uh, you can only run two at the same time. But that's perfect for my needs because I have a hard drive and a CD-ROM, so I only have two devices that I need to connect anyway. Next up, we have the obligatory uh, network card, of course, because you always need a network card on a vintage computer, just so you can transfer files onto it easily. And um, this came with a computer actually, so I'm just going to stick it back in. It's always nice to have a network card. And then, just for fun, I'm putting in a modem. This is a Diamond Super Express 56i Pro. Wow, sounds fancy. Now, obviously it doesn't make a whole lot of sense putting this in a vintage PC today, but back in the day, in the late 90s, you needed a modem to go online. And any PC that you bought would need a modem. And especially if you bought a high-end PC like this, it would have come with a nice high-end internal modem like this. So I thought it would just be fun to throw one of these in just to, you know, complete the whole system as it were. And obviously to power all of this, we're gonna need a power supply. And I'm gonna use this one. It's a Super Channel 450 watt ATX power supply. This is actually a more modern power supply. It has these black connectors, as you can see. Um, it's not ideal, but it should still work, and I might just have to use a lot of um, splitter cables to get the required number of Molex connectors out of it, but it should be fine for this build. It's got more than enough power. Another important aspect of a really top-notch gaming PC is, of course, the audio. And we're gonna go for something really fancy here as well. This Sound Blaster Live Gold Sound Card. This is the top of the line model and featured these gold plated 
connectors for uh, all of your input and output jacks on the back of the card. And this would have been one of the best and most expensive sound cards you could get for the PC at the time. This is the 4620 model, which comes with this little daughter board that allows for all sorts of digital audio functions, like these SPDIF digital audio input and output connections, some MIDI inputs and outputs, and also the connection of some high-end creative speakers through this DIN connector here. Speaking of um, speakers, these are the bad boys which we are going to use for this build. Now I picked these up the day after building the machine and they were very kindly loaned to me by a viewer named Justin here in Johannesburg. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Justin for allowing me to use his awesome speakers in this video. So the reason I wanted to borrow these speakers is because I think they will make the perfect companion to the Sound Blaster Live sound card that we already have. These Cambridge Soundworks speakers were very high-end PC speakers. They were basically designed for and marketed alongside the Sound Blaster Live sound card. And although few could probably afford it, many people would have dreamt of having both the Gold Edition Sound Blaster Live and this 5.1 Cambridge surround sound speaker set so as to enjoy one of the best audio experiences available on the PC at the time. But that experience came at a cost, naturally, with these speakers alone priced at between $1 and $200. You can see on the box that these sold for 3,000 Rand here in South Africa. So just to put that in context, I paid 1,800 Rand for my Voodoo 2 in late 1998. So 3,000 Rand is pretty insane for a set of speakers. But that's kind of what this board is all about. We throw out the budget and build the 1999 dream machine that I never would have been able to afford at the time. But anyway, I think we've spent enough time looking at hardware. Let's get into some building. So I ran into a bit of a problem while installing this SCSI hard drive and that is namely that this case has got these pre-drilled holes on the side which means you have to choose one of the fixed positions like this one for example. The case that this hard drive and the hard drive cooler originally came out of had these elongated long holes that allowed you to slide the hard drive back and forth as you needed it so you could put it wherever you wanted it but this case has fixed holes so I don't have that option and I can't move the hard drive back otherwise it would only be held in by one screw at the very front so it wouldn't work so what I'm gonna have to do instead is to move this hard drive cooler down into this slot underneath instead and then just install it there it's not actually the end of the world because this hard drive does have all those cooling fins on it so I think this cooler will still provide pretty decent cooling in this slot below the hard drive um, but it is just a bit of a pity that I wasn't able to put it right in front like the original mounting. So that's it. This machine is now pretty much almost done, but there is one finishing touch. As you saw earlier, I pretty much based this PC on an old Alienware PC from the late 90s. And obviously because Alienware is still a trademark name today, actually wait, hold on, is it? Yes, yes it is. I can't go ahead and use Alienware due to copyright reasons, so what I've done is I've created my own brand. Uh, something mildly similar, you could say. Presenting UFO Gear. It's like Alienware but with 100% more chicken. And I even created this amazing epoxy case badge just to complete the look and make it look somewhat professional. Ah, perfect. And with that, it is now time for my gratuitously extravagant reveal of my Monster Pentium 3 build.
That was way more dramatic than it needed to be. But anyway, that's pretty much going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I did making it. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing to my channel, and let me know in the comments below what you thought of this build, or what you think I should add to it, or what I should have done differently, etc. Also, stay tuned for part 2 of my Monster Voodoo 3 build, where we will get to see just how well this machine can play some of the most popular games of the time. But until then, cheers guys.